for that song service. And now, if you like, let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Again, in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and then the book of Galatians. And as you know, as Proverbs 3, 5 has told us, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. And that's the faith rest life where we trust in the word of God and not rely upon ourselves or our own human means or ways of accomplishing uh, our uh, pro or overcoming our problems and our difficulties. So we find ourselves now in the book of Galatians. And as uh, we're going to take a little hiatus as I uh, mentioned to you uh, uh, from the book of Proverbs. We've done uh, chapters 1 through 15 in the book of Proverbs and uh, I'm going to take a little hiatus. We're going to study the book of Galatians, but I'm going to do it a little bit differently and I'm going to go through it very quickly. I'm going to try to get one chapter in per uh, service that we have together and occasionally I'm, I'm sure I'm going to slip in a doctrine here or there. So again, there are six chapters in total and I've already had two uh, lessons of introduction this past week that uh, you can go back and uh, get that information if you have haven't seen it, but ultimately I introduced a little bit about the history of the people of Galatia and then also the, uh, the reason why Paul had wrote this book to the Galatian uh, people as well. I'm going to give you a brief and an overview of that this morning, uh, but then we're going to go through uh, chapter one this morning, giving you the highlights and just let the Bible kind of talk to us and then I'll explain to you various points and principles uh, that are important that come out of this for our own edification and for our application. But first and foremost, I wanted to show you again this map that talks about the Galatian people. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but way down here, uh, let me see if I can get the pen up and uh, see if that works. Again, I got a new laptop here and a, a new thing going on. But ultimately, let's see, is it working? What do I have to do to get the pen? The pen, the pen, the pen. Let me just see, pen, okay. Does it do anything? Can you see anything? Why doesn't the pen work when I do it? I see it on my end, but I don't see it on the other. Do you see it? Oh, there it is. See all the scribbles? See the scribblies down there? Okay, that's the best I can do drawing, okay? That's the best I can do. But <laughs> So I guess it comes up after you're done penning. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll be learning about this thing. But first and foremost, look at the left side of this. Again, over in this geographic location over there, you see on the left side, that is where the Gaulish people came from, which we also know as the Celtic people. And what's interesting is that the Celtic people that we know as the Irish people today, primarily in the Celtic or the Gaelic language, again, they started in that area that ultimately is France today. And also up in the... Uh, northern part up here called the Rhine, which was part of Germany. Ultimately, there are cultures that have come together, and these groups have collectively come together and down into that area primarily, and this was over the first 1,000 years B.C., or about 1,000 years before Christ when all of these, uh, these cultures started to come together. And they became quite an you know, impressive culture and uh, really started to spread their culture throughout the world at that time as well. And as you know, some of them drifted up all the way over to Ireland as we have it today. And if you can see, I don't know if you can see it very well, but see how there are stripes on the uh, map up there in those various geographic locations? Well, as you can see on the, the key of the chart here, that's where even today that Gaelic or Celtic language continues to be spoken. And so we have it spoken up in the Scotland area, also down down in uh, Ireland as well, in uh, parts of Wales, uh, a part of Great Britain. And then also we see it over here in the uh, coast of the east, the western coast of uh, France as we know it today as well. So they still have that tongue and dialect going on in those geographic locations. So again, about a thousand years BC, these people, again, these different tribes coming together and forming civilizations with their cultures and their language coming together. And these Gaelic people, as they would call, uh, called, or even the Gaulish people, ultimately then migrated uh, throughout what we know as uh, Southern Europe today. And they migrated all the way down, as you can see, over these various areas, and coming to the place that we know as Greece today, which is down in this area as well. And you can see there Thracian, okay? And uh, Thrace was the uh, major city there. They came down into that city, again, even through warfare, and defeated the Thracian people. And ultimately were overthrowing one of the groups uh, that were left over from the Greek Empire that was under Alexander the Great. 
and they defeated them in battle and then m migrated all the way down as to what we know as where the Galatian area is today. Again, my scribble is uh, really helping you, I'm sure. Learn these things this morning. But you can see again uh, what, we ca what was called Galatia back in the day. Now today we know this area as Turkey. And so that's where Turkey is actually situated today. But in that time, it was also called Galatia. And during the time of Paul, it was also known as the Galatian region. Now, I went into more history in detail this past week, and you can go and understand that, because once these individuals came down, then the Roman Empire started to, you know, uh, blossom and overtook these individuals as well. And they became a province or a part of the Roman Empire, and they were under Roman authority, especially during the times of Jesus and uh, the time of Paul as well. So again, just a brief history, but these Gaulish people really, tra you know, uh, you know, uh, moved and migrated throughout what we know as uh, northern uh, Mediterranean European uh, countries, and ultimately settled in that place of Galatia, or a group of them settled in that place of Galatia as we know it today. Now, Paul wrote this book <clears throat> in 49 A.D. So it was only you know, several years after the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ had died and then ascended, because he died and ascended up into heaven around 33 AD. And in the late 40s AD, Paul then went on his first missionary journey. And he traveled throughout that region. And that primarily was the only region that he went to in the first missionary journey. And he went and established several churches in the cities of Antioch, Iconium, Listeria, and Derbe. And in Acts chapter 13 and 14, you can read about that when he went and visited those individuals. And he brought the gospel message of Jesus Christ. He revealed to them the Messiah. Remember, he would typically go to a synagogue and talk to the Jewish people and say, all the things that we've noted in the law have now been fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. All these sacrifices, all these nuances of the law that talk about God and talked about what God would do for us to pay the penalty for our sins have been fulfilled in the person and the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he gave them the gospel message and he said salvation is based on faith alone and Christ alone, believing in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who is the Messiah prophesied. And so he came and he delivered that message and began churches in these areas. But soon after he had left these people, another group came in, as we're going to talk about them uh, consistently as we go through this book of Galatians. Another group came in called the Judaizers. And basically these were Jewish Christians at the time, but they brought in a false doctrine. They brought in something more than just faith alone and Christ alone. They brought in something more than its salvation by believing in Christ and his work upon the cross and his resurrection. They brought in, yes, Christ, Christ is there, but you also still have to fulfill the law. You have to be circumcised. You have to live by the dietary rituals. You have to fulfill every jot and tittle of the law or try to in your life. And when you do that, then you will be saved. And so these individuals got that term Judaizers because they were trying to bring Judaism into Christianity and ultimately bringing the law of Judaism into Christianity. And again, those two things don't mix, especially the way that they were bringing it in. So ultimately, Paul in 49 AD wrote this letter urgently, and he wrote it to the Galatian people or the people in those uh, four major cities, as I mentioned to you, to tell them or to remind them of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and say, you know, no longer are we under the law. No longer do we keep the law. And that's what the book of Galatians is all about. It's to remind us that we are not under the law. You see, even in the Old Testament, the law did not save anybody, even though they kept the law. That didn't bring salvation to them. All it was was good works that they did. Even in the Old Testament, their salvation was based on faith. Just as in the New Testament, in the day and age in which we live in, in the church age, our salvation is based on faith. Faith alone. Faith in the person of Jesus Christ, his work on the cross for the payment of the penalty of our sins, and that he was resurrected from the dead uh, three days later. Believing that God has done all the work to pay for our sins. 
And so that's the message that Paul was bringing. And ultimately, the false doctrines were coming into these people. And ultimately, Paul then wrote this book to remind them that it's not based on work. And we're going to see that as we go through the details of this. But as we see, again, in that first missionary journey that Paul went through, and he can follow the lines on the map, but ultimately, up in that top left-hand corner, let me see if I still get the pen going on here. You know, we see that group of cities uh, there, Iconium, Listeria, uh, Derby. We see Antioch at the north as well. But all of this was part of that, even though on this map it just has Galatia there, but that Galatian region encompassed all of these areas and kind of went up like this and encompassed that entire area. And uh, ultimately that was known as the province of Galatia. So when Paul wrote the book of Galatians, or ultimately it was a letter to these individuals, it wasn't to just one church, but to the churches in that region that he met on his first missionary journey. And they were to take that letter and pass it from church to church to church so that they would be assured of having the truth of God's word given to them. You see other books like the book of Ephesians or the book of Corinthians, that, that was a letter that was written to one specific city church at that point in time. But, but as they all have, you know, as all the letters were written, they all would be distributed amongst all the churches, and they have been for us, so that we have the complete uh, canon of scriptures as we know it. But here Paul was writing to a regional people because the Judaizers had come in right behind him and said, don't listen to Paul. And there were several things that they were doing to discredit Paul. Don't listen to Paul. He's not right. And ultimately, Paul then uh, wrote this book to refute their argument, to refute the things that they were saying, to get people straight with the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ once again. So that gives us a little background and backdrop as to uh, why Paul had written this and the people that he had written it to. Again, uh, even in these cities, though, of Antioch, Iconium, Listeria, and Derbe, uh, there was some of the ethnic influence of the Galatians that had mixed in with those people as well. But it was also kind of a melting pot. You had Jewish people there, you had Greek people there, you had Roman people there. Again, it was quite a melting pot of people. So it wasn't just all the Irish-speaking people, as we would call it today, uh, that are in that area, the Gaelic or the Celtic people or language that was uh, being spoken there. It was kind of a melting pot of a society at that time. And the true Gaulish or Gaelic, Celtic, ethnic people, you know, they, they stayed more to the north and maintained their society up there as well. So again, in this melting pot of an area, Again, Paul writing to primarily the Jewish people uh, initially, but then also reaching out to the Gentiles as well giving them the truth of the gospel message, but then false doctrine coming in and falling behind. And so that introduces us to what this book of Galatians is all about. So let's start and let's get into it a little bit. And let's look at verses one through five. And we call this the opening salutation or the greeting salutation. Again, as was custom in writing a letter, Paul is introducing himself, saying hello, and putting some important uh, theological principles right to the fore. So he starts off by saying in verse one, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ in God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us out of this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. And so in verses 1 through 5, we have that opening salutation. We have that opening greeting. But within that, there are some very important principles that Paul is doing right off the bat. And so in verse 1, when it says, Paul, he's introducing himself. This is who I am. Then what does he go on to say? An apostle. You see, one of the things that these Judaizers were doing was saying, don't listen to Paul. He's not one of the original 12. You see, he wasn't one of the 12 picked by Jesus during Jesus's ministry. Paul was picked by Jesus Christ after his resurrection. Paul started out as a Pharisee, and he was himself a Judaizer, we could call him. In other words, he was very strict in the Jewish religion of the day. And ultimately, in his, the beginning of his ministry, the beginning of his life. He was steeped in Judaism. 
And he was so steeped in it that he was going out and persecuting Christians. He was going out and killing Christians or having them killed. He was going out when, when Stephen was stoned to death in the book of Acts and we read that for preaching Christ. Paul was right there holding the coats or the cloaks of everybody who was picking up a stone and, and uh, stoning Stephen to death for his witness of the gospel message. He had people imprisoned. He had people jailed. He had them beaten. He was persecuting the church. And then God came to him, as you know, on his road to Tarsus and ultimately said, you know, knocked him off his horse and blinded him. And he said, Saul, Saul, that was his name before, uh, you know, God changing it to Paul to show the difference in his life now. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You see, he was persecuting Christians, but Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? You see, and that's what happens when we are persecuted as Christians. Ultimately, they're not persecuting us, they're persecuting our Lord because they're attacking him. And Paul was attacking the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was attacking those who would believe upon Jesus Christ. And as you know, we are in union with Christ. So therefore, Christ was being attacked. So as Paul started out, he was one of those individuals that was attacking the church and saying, no, Christ is not the Messiah. But yet the Messiah revealed himself to Paul personally, and Paul understood now what that law was all about. He understood what the Old Testament uh, was all about, what the, what the law was about, what the first five books of the Bible were all about. He understood now what that was, and he became a believer. He understood Jesus Christ as his Messiah, and he personally received him as his Messiah. And so then, sometime after, then uh, Paul being taught by Jesus Christ personally, and we're going to read about that when we uh, see in just a little bit, you know, he went off into the desert in Arabia, uh, as we, what we would know as Saudi Arabia today, or even Iraq in those areas. He went off into the desert and was with Christ personally, and was being pa uh, taught by Christ personally and understood the Gospels and understood the doctrines and now was led by Christ to go out and be a missionary to a lost and dying world and bring that good news of the Gospel message. But yet as he did that with these people in the Galatian region, he was being attacked and saying, no, he's not one of the twelve. Remember, Judas Iscariot was one of the twelve and then Judas Iscariot was a traitor and really not a, truly not a believer. And so to fulfill that last apostleship, again, God or Jesus Christ selected Paul himself and said, you and now are an apostle as well. And so as these Judaizers were saying, don't listen to Paul, no authority, no apostle. Paul is reiterating, look, I am an apostle and I was established by the person of Jesus Christ himself. And he goes on to say, what does he say in the first half? Not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, who raised Christ from the dead. So there we see he was established by God himself. He's not saying, you know, the 12 picked me. In Acts chapter 1, as I have up on the board, in Acts chapter 1, verses 21 and 26, you can read about the 11 apostles who were remaining after Christ's resurrection. And they deciding to choose amongst two other men of which one would fill Judas Iscariot's seat. And they threw lots and said, well, we'll throw the lots. And whoever comes up, that will be God's, you know, uh, uh, God's way of saying to us, yes, this is the one that I want to replace. Judas Iscariot, who has rebelled. But in Acts chapter 1, verse 21 through 26, we see them operating from their humanity. And they selected this individual called Matthias that we really never hear about again. I'm sure he was a great man. I'm sure he was a great witness and a great apostle. But he wasn't an apostle selected by God. You see, these apostles did that act before they had, before the day of Pentecost, before they had the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and they did it from their own power and their own flesh. And these men selected another. And so Paul is pointing that out here when he's saying, you know, I wasn't selected by man. I was selected by Christ himself and God the Father himself. He's establishing his authority. He's not just telling them that, you know, you know, this group of guys picked me, but he's saying that God picked me just like he did the other 11. And so therefore he is qualified as an apostle. And remember that we understand that every word of scripture that we have before us is divinely inspired. In other words, the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write these things. He's not trying to establish himself as this great and wonderful individual, but the Holy Spirit is trying to establish him as an apostle with authority so that these individuals would understand the truth. 
And then he goes on to say in verse 2, what does he say? And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Now, when he says all the brethren with, uh, who are with me, you see, in other books, he names names. He says Timothy sometimes, Silas sometimes, Barnabas sometimes. He says, we greet you. But here he's saying, I greet you. But at the same time, he's saying all these other guys that are with me who came with me, like Barnabas and others who came with me on this missionary journey, and you've already met, they are saying hi too. But he's saying, but first and foremost, he's not giving names because he's trying to establish himself as different from those. The Holy Spirit is establishing him as different from the rest, which he is. And he has authority and he has that apostleship and he is that fantastic and great messenger. Now, as we look at verse three, when it says grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When he says that phrase, grace and peace, as we have in the English, basically, that's an old Hebrew greeting. It's an old Jewish greeting and it's the greeting shalom in the Hebrew. And the Hebrew word shalom does mean grace, peace, prosperity. And it's what they would do when they would greet one another or even when they would say goodbye. They would say shalom to one another. Now, as you know, and some of you know who have been here with me for a while, you know, if you like to be, if you're a Star Trek fan like I am and you know Dr. Spock, live long and prosper, okay, it's the same thing. Spock and uh, most of the other uh, cast of characters on that show were all Jewish individuals. And they brought in that Jewish greeting, live long and prosper, shalom, ultimately is what they were saying in that uh, uh, greeting. Grace and peace to you is what we have now in our English translation. Charis and arene is what we have in the Greek. Again, grace and peace coming to you. And not only is this a greeting, but also he's establishing two major themes of this book. And we will note these as we continue to go through. The grace of God. You see, everything about the spiritual life is about the grace of God. Jesus died for us. God did all the work to save us. He has given us this opportunity for salvation. We don't do it ourselves. Grace means he gives it to us. And as I've shared with you in the past, if you've ever been to a party, and uh, Donna had a great party for her daughter yesterday and uh, celebrating her remission from cancer, and uh, cancer treatments were successful, so they had a great cookout. And uh, typically when you go to a party, there's usually a tray of food that people bring around in an hors d'oeuvre tray, and they say, here, take. You see, the host is providing the food, and they're saying, it's yours to take freely. Who did all the work? Did you, coming to the party, do all the work? No, you didn't do anything. You just showed up. And then you just received what the guest or the host was giving to you. And that's grace. You see, Donna showed grace yesterday. She emulated the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we should all do that as we give freely of our time, our talent, and our treasure. But God gives us his grace by giving his son for our salvation. God gives us his grace so that we can walk faithfully in the spiritual life and serve him and uh, do his will and work for us each and every day. God does all the work. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit. He leads us in our spiritual walk. That's the grace of God. Grace is a very important doctrine. If you're going to be a Christian and live in Christianity, you have to understand grace. And you have to live by grace. Understand that you've received grace and thereby you've given grace to other people. Also, he says peace. Again, what's peace? Relaxed mental attitude, a, a faith rest life. You know, that peace, that prosperity, that inner happiness, that inner joy, that inner rest. You see, that's what God wants for, for us. He doesn't want us to be worry warts. He doesn't want us to be all caught up in our, you know, agita and uh, problems and difficulties and being concerned about this, that, and everything. Yes, we have to manage those things within our lives, but we should not let that be, become a wreck within our soul. Again, we should be at peace within our soul and handle the details of life and deal with them appropriately. These are the main doctrines of salvation, grace and peace. The grace of God has given you salvation. Salvation is what? Brought you peace. You are no longer at enmity with the Father. You are now one with Christ. You have peace with God. Then as we move down to verse 4, what does he say? Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us out of this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. You see, when he talks about uh, here is the other main theme, which is the death of Jesus Christ. Christ is the one who paid the penalty for our sins. He died so that we would not have to. Christ took on the sins of the entire world. As we also note in that second phrase, this present evil age. 
Now, when he uses that word present here, histomy is what you would think, or anhistomy is the Hebrew, a Greek word there. That word for present doesn't just mean right now, okay? You know, we all think we live in an evil age in our generation, don't we? We look at the news, we see the wars, we see this, we see that. We think it's worse than any time before. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you, but it's not, okay? It's not. Again, I recommend, uh, uh, Bob just uh, gave me a book, and I read it during vacation, uh, uh, the, the Killing of Jesus by uh, Bill O'Reilly. Good book. And he it takes it from a different perspective because he talks about the history of the Roman Empire at the time, and he gives you a little bit of backdrop of the culture and what's going on in Judaism and what was going on also in the Roman Empire and how these forces came together and ultimately brought about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And he gets into a little bit at the end about the horrific death that he suffered. But I tell you, you know, you go back to the history, you talk about evil. Huh, there was a lot of evil back then. These Roman emperors and the Roman Empire, you think it's evil today? You don't know nothing. <laughs> this is like, you know, rainbows and ponies, uh, unicorns, as we would call it, in what we're living in today. You know, this is marshmallow fluff compared to what they uh, endured and suffered back in the day. Okay? So again, never get too caught up in, oh, it's more evil than it ever has been before. No. <laughs> it was pretty evil. <laughs> and despicable. I, mean, I won't go into it, but in any case, because I digress, and I'm not going to get through this chapter today. But in any case, this present evil age is really just saying, he's talking about the entire human race here. He's not just talking about my generation, okay? He's talking about the age in which we live in. You see, we are in an age called the human race history. You see, before God created the heavens and the earth, God existed, and that was an age past. After he destroys this heaven and earth that we know it and recreates a new heaven and a new earth, that will begin a new age called eternity future. We are in a present evil age. And why is it an evil age? Because sin is in the world. Satan is loosed and Satan is free. It's an evil age. It's an evil time that we all live in. But the gospel of Jesus Christ has come to rectify all of that. So this present evil age is really emphasizing the work of Christ upon the cross. He says he died for the sins of the entire world for this present evil age. In other words, for the entire human race. Because sin is rampant from the beginning of time to the end of time as we know it. Sin will be in the world. And Jesus Christ died and paid for our sins because we could not overcome our own sins. We could not pay for our own sins, but ultimately he did. And then in verse 5, before we get into section 2, what is it all about? To whom be the glory forevermore, A.M. Uh, A.M. <laughs> Amen. It, I know it's the A.M. right now, okay? Amen, okay? <laughs> to him be the glory forevermore. And that's what it's all about. It's all about God's glory. You see, yes, we will receive glory. We have an opportunity to share in his glory. But our life, it's all about his glory. The death of Christ was about his glory. It's all about the glory of God. And so Paul in this letter is reminding us all, it's not about man. It's not about you and me. It's about him. It's about his glory. It's about what he has done for us. So then we get into verses 6 through 10, which is Paul's opening argument. Now, not only has he given us highlights, he's established himself as an apostle sent by God. It's all about grace and peace to the glory of God and the death of Jesus Christ. And that's our way of salvation. Then in verse 6, the argument, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting. I love that word, deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ from a different gospel which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the, distort the gospel of Christ. But even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So here we have his opening argument. And again, we see the Judaizers who were attacking Paul's message of a non-meritorious faith in Jesus Christ. They were attacking his apostleship. They were attacking the message. 
And what was happening here in verse 6, he says, I am amazed at how quickly you are deserting the truth. <laughs> Not only the truth, but him who called you. <laughs> I, I'm amazed at how quickly you're deserting God. And you see, these Galatians had believed in his gospel message. Now they're easily being deceived and easily being influenced by the false doctrine of saying, not only is it faith in Christ, but it's faith plus keeping the law, which is a false doctrine. It's a false gospel. And so Paul is calling that out. And these people were easily deceived. Just as, you know, as, as he says, I'm amazed. And I'm amazed too, because I see it in our day and age as well. I'm always amazed at people who have been taught the truth of the Word of God year after year after year. And some people have been in it for years. And then some, you know, uh, character comes along and starts teaching them a false doctrine. For example, the one that we have recently, you don't need to confess your sins, you know, for the filling and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And how easily people just go along with that. You know, it's one thing to be the one that's teaching the false doctrine. It's another thing to be the one that has learned the truth for many years and now just say, oh, okay, all right, whatever you say. How quickly they desert God. And that's what's in view here. And that's what we're seeing. And again, you know, this isn't just any old false doctrine, but this is the main false doctrine of the gospel message. And it's one thing to teach a false doctrine, but it's something else to teach a false gospel. And that's even worse. And as Paul says, let them be accursed. In other words, you know, there's going to be discipline. There's going to be problem. There's going to be difficulty because they're attacking the person and the work of Jesus Christ. But as we know, you know, uh, salvation is, as Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, as Paul said, it's by grace or, 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 or by faith you have been saved. By grace. Not of any works, lest any man should boast. It's a gift of God. Again, so that no man can boast. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So again, it's a grace-based, faith-based salvation that we receive. In other words, God did all the work. He brought the hors d'oeuvre trade by calling the cross of Jesus Christ. And all we did was take from it and say, yes, I believe. And we have salvation. And that's being attacked. That was attacked during his day and age. It's attacked during our day and age as well. And he also goes on to say in verse 7, which is really not another. Now, this is an interesting phrase, which is really not another. He says a different gospel. Now, the gospel that they were bringing was, yeah, okay, Jesus is the Messiah, but you've got to keep the law. So the gospel that they were bringing was the law, the law, the law. You've got to keep the law, you've got to keep the law, you've got to keep the law. And he says, you know, it's really not a different gospel in a sense. You see, dramatically, the way they were putting it together and saying, by keeping the law, you need salvation, it is a different doctrine. But in reality, what is the law? The law, as Paul is going to tell us in Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, is a tutor. And you see, the law showed the Israelites, showed the world of the coming Messiah. It pointed to the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so he can truly say, it's really not another, because the law was all about pointing to Christ. But the fact of the matter is it is now a false doctrine because we don't have to keep, never had to, and never do have to, never will have to be saved by keeping the law. So it's not another because it all pointed to Christ. That's what he's saying. Remember what Titus chapter 3, or Paul said in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, it says, But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, by keeping the law, in other words, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration, the renewing by the Holy Spirit. You see, that's what salvation is all about. God does all the work. All we need to do is receive, say yes. That's it. But God does the work. In verses 8 and 9, here we see the serious consequences of those who would teach the false doctrine. And, and again, we have to remember that. It's a serious offense to teach false doctrine. And it's even a more serious offense to teach a false gospel. And that's what's in view here, teaching a false doctrine. And many denominations today teach you several things. One is they, you know, not only do you have to be saved, but you've got to be a good person. You've got to keep the, keep the laws and the commandments. And they may not be going back to the Old Testament laws, but they're now establishing their man-made laws and traditions, as Paul would call it, in this passage. You've got to do what we say, plus believe in Jesus. Then you'll be saved. And that's a false gospel. It's a false doctrine. 
And there are serious consequences for those who uh, teach that and go forward with that. And then as we have in verse 10, Paul addresses another attack on his ministry. And uh, we hear this today in our day and age as well. You see, they were saying, oh, he's trying to seek the favor of men. How is he trying to see, uh, seek the favor of men? By teaching them a simple doctrine. You know, don't, you know, when you have witnessed, I'm sure you've told people, all you've got to do is believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And what's their typical response? Oh, that's too easy. Don't I have to be a good person? Don't I have to work for it? And also they say, well, what about the murderer? Is he going to be in heaven? Well, absolutely. Jesus died for his sins just as much as he died for anybody else if he believes. What about, you know, so again, when you witness, they say, oh, that's too easy. And so that's what they were saying to Paul. It's too easy. And you're just trying to gain their favor. Rather than having them, you know, work under the rigid code of the law, again, you're just trying to, oh, it's easy peasy. God, just follow me. You know, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a break from all that work you have to do. And so again, you know, he refutes that. And he says in verse 10, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? After he just said, may they be accursed. Again, when you go around and you just try to say, oh, you're accursed. <laughs> you think people are going to be, oh, I like you. Okay, thank you for cursing me. Absolutely not. You're not, you're not seeking their favor by saying you're cursed. Okay, so who am I trying to please here? And he's saying, I'm trying to please God. Plain and simple. And that should be our ministry as well. You see, many times, and when we, you know, as I have up on the comparison in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, you see, Paul in that verse says, I'm all things to all men so that I may win them. In other words, Paul did try to appease men from time to time to try to win them to salvation. But we have to balance our, our scripture with scripture because here he's saying, you know what? Sometimes, yeah, you have to kind of be a chameleon in order to help them to understand the gospel. Be, you know, get down to their level. Be in the place that they are and operate in that way so they can understand the gospel message and maybe receive it. But at the same time, he's saying it's not about seeking their favor. It's about giving them the gospel, serving God and glorifying God. And as he says here, am I now seeking the favor of man? No, he's not. You see, sometimes when you witness to other people, whether they be a believer or an unbeliever, sometimes you get to step on their toes. Again, it shouldn't be the main mode of your ministry to step on everybody's toes and beat them over the head with your big thumping Bible, like some like to do. <laughs> right? That shouldn't be the mainstay of your ministry because you're not going to win many people to Christ. But there are times, as Paul says here, you know, sometimes you've got to hit them right between the eyes. And you've got to tell them like it is. And tell them, here's what the Word of God says, and here's what you're not doing. And I've found that many times, you know, uh, when uh, people have asked for advice or, or opinion or counsel, you know, and, you know, and sometimes I'll try to be nice, and I'll try to give them some good information and leave it at that. It doesn't seem to be successful sometimes. <laughs> okay. But then other times I tell them right like it is. You know, you need to do something different. You need to change your life in this way or that way. You need to be obedient to the Word of God. That's typically when I see response. It's amazing. And that's what Paul's saying here, you know? And that's what he's doing to these Judaizers, you know? He's not saying, oh, just go along with whatever they say, and let's just, you know, can't we all just get along? He's saying, no, it's a false doctrine. It's a false gospel. And I'm amazed at how easily you've been swayed and how quickly you've deserted God. He's not saying you deserted me. He's saying you deserted God. How quickly you've done that. So that's what Paul is doing here up to this point. And uh, again, defending the information. And he says, I'm not trying to please God, but I'm, excuse me, I'm not trying to please man, but I'm trying to please God because I am his slave. I'm his bond servant, as he says. And you see, our attitude should always be, how am I glorifying God? And we should be assessing every situation and using discernment to say, is this a time to appease or is this a time to, you know, get, tell it like it is and hit them right between the eyes. And when you can have that type of discernment, as we've been noting in the book of Proverbs, the discerning heart, then ultimately you will be that servant of God. and You'll be an effective uh, witness for God. So now as we get into uh, section 3, verses 11 through 24, I know there's a lot of verses here, but it really is talking about 
again, how Paul acquired his gospel and his authority. So let's just read that, and we don't have much to say there, but I'll give you a couple of things. Where it says in verse 11, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it, through a revelation from Jesus Christ. And again, there's a little bit of English added in there, but ultimately he said, I received a revelation from Christ, or better yet, Christ was revealed to me is what he's saying. Christ was revealed to me. And he was when he knocked him off his horse on the road to Damascus. He says, for you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. Notice he's calling them traditions now. In other words, this was their interpretation of what the law was all about, which unfortunately was a wrong interpretation. But when he who had sent me or set me apart, even from my mother's womb and call me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Paul. You see, he wasn't trying to get Paul's approval. He just got acquainted with him and stayed with him for 15 days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now in what I am writing you, I assure you before God that I'm not lying. Then I went into the region of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, uh, which were in Christ. But only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us, persecuted us is now preaching the faith, which he once tried to destroy and they were glorifying because of God all right so again and they were uh, glorifying because of God and uh, because of me glorifying God because of me and so ultimately what he's trying to do here is continue to establish his credentials saying this wasn't given to me by God but it was given me by a acalyptus okay and that's where we get our word uh, apocalypse from and that is the word that means revealed within the Greek in other words Christ revealed himself to Paul God the Father revealed Revealed Jesus Christ to him. And not only did he reveal himself to him, but he revealed Paul's new authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ, being one of the twelve, being now numbered as one of the twelve. And then when we get into verses 13 and 14, Paul mentions his former manner of life. As I said to you before, he used to persecute the church. And that phrase, I was even more zealous than any of my contemporaries. In other words, Paul's saying, you know, these guys that came in, I understand where they're coming from. I used to be one of them. But you know what? I was even worse than them. I didn't just come in and say, you know, don't believe in Paul and don't believe in this this new gospel. He said, I would come in and put him to jail. I would come in and kill him. I would do that. He says, I understand and I get what they're doing. But I also understand now what they're doing is all wrong. I've been on their side. You know, Like we talk about Jesus Christ as our mediator. You know, he's both God and man. He suffered as man. He knows who God is. Therefore, he can mediate between us and God because he was like both of us and he can understand both of us. Well, that's what Paul's saying here. I'm a mediator. I used to be them and I now understand, you know, the truth. And I can put that together and that's what I'm giving to you. Paul understood where they're coming from and all he cared about was leading them to Christ and giving them the truth. And so Paul here distinguishes between the absolute truth of God's word and the man-made doctrines, the traditions that are passed down. And you see in many denominational churches, there's a lot of traditions that they pass down from generation to generation. Sometimes, and again in the New Testament, occasionally the word tradition is used for a good thing, but many times it becomes a man-made thing and it becomes very false in its application. Just as in the Old Testament when, uh, you know, uh, the the snakes were coming into the uh, encampment and Moses lifted up the brazen serpent on a standard. And all they had to do was look at it and then they would be healed from the poisonous serpents. 
And what did they do? They later on, that was all a picture of Christ and his work and his, his work upon the cross and their salvation. And later on, they took that, that brazen serpent and they started to worship it. They started to lift it up, it up on high rather than God. And so ultimately, God sent a prophet to destroy that thing because it was a man-made tradition. It wasn't what they were supposed to be doing. And so we, too, have to be very careful about our traditions and what we uh, classify as traditions and make sure that they are according to the Word of God and not just a man-made thing that we're passing down because easily it gets corrupted. And so the false doctrine that these uh, Judaizers were bringing, the false gospel, were the traditions. And ultimately, God was revealing to them what the truth was all about. Again, don't follow these traditions. Don't follow the man-made doctrines. In other words, follow Christ and do as Christ, uh, you know, has asked us to do. And remember the grace gospel that Christ has given us. And then as we wrap it up in verses 15 through 24, we see Paul speaking about his own conversion. And again, he's not seeking approval from man. And we see him talking about his apostleship. We're seeing him talk about his ministry. We see that he did go talk to the other apostles. But again, he just met he, well, some of them, Peter and James, who was the Lord's half-brother, as we know. And he just got acquainted with them. He wasn't looking for approval. He didn't need approval. This is another point that you know, we need to take away. You don't need the approval of man to go out and witness. You know? God has commissioned you from the moment of your salvation to be a royal priest and a royal ambassador. You don't need my permission. You don't need anybody else's permission. God has given you that permission by making you an ambassador to go witness the gospel message. So go and do. And don't be waiting for somebody to say, go do this or go do that. Again, in any ministry that you may be involved in, within the church. You know, everybody waits around for the pastor to say, uh, Jim, what should I do? You know, or, oh, you know or, or they don't want to come forward if I don't say do this or do that. You know, don't wait for me. I got too many other things I'm thinking about. Okay, I'm not thinking about everything all the time. But you are. So if there's something that you want to do, do it. And don't wait for approval from man. Just go out and do it and witness the gospel message. And so as we come back on Tuesday, we're going to look uh, uh, just uh, briefly a little bit more because uh, let's just look at verse 15. Because in verse 15... You know, if I was studying this word by word as we typically do the other books, we would be five months on verse 15. And I'll tell you why. It says, But when he who set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace, was pleased. You know, there are actually six doctrines right there. <laughs> six doctrines. The doctrine of the foreknowledge and predestination plan that God has for our lives, for the believers' lives. I'll talk a little bit about that on Tuesday. The sanctification, being set apart, being made holy. The calling of God is another one. The election of God, the grace of God, and God's divine pleasure or the favor of God. Those are all doctrines that are, you know, expanded throughout the New Testament. And I'll briefly touch upon all six of those on Tuesday to, uh, just to remind you of what those things are and, or if you haven't heard about them before to introduce them to you. But I'll introduce them to you so that you can understand. But right here in this one verse, again, six doctrines that we could extrapolate and spend months and months and months on uh, you know, searching the scriptures about. But we're not going to do that because we're just trying to get the overview message here and the overall uh, a, a point that Paul is trying to bring here. And that is the grace message of Jesus Christ and his work upon the cross for our salvation. So we'll see more of that as we get into it uh, later on this, uh, this week. All right, so let's close there in prayer. Father, we uh, just thank you for this word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for setting apart Paul, too, for us, Father, to be that great apostle that you uh, sent to the Gentiles and to the Jews as well, but ultimately giving him the grace of the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ, and him being one chosen to deliver that to us. We thank you for setting him apart for our benefit. But more importantly, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that has given us his word through Paul and through the other writers of the uh, Old and the New Testament. We thank you for all of their work and their service so that we could have these things before us, these truths that are so powerful and impactful and rich in our lives. And Father, we just ask that these things are meaningful to us and we retain these things and apply them as we go forward in our daily walk. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, by the power of your spirit, we pray. Amen. All right, well, thank you very much for that portion of our service. And now we move to the uh, offering.
uh, portion. Now is the time where we uh, take of an offering where we give back to God the first fruits of all that he has given to us and honor God through giving. Now this is the uh, uh, last Sunday of the month of July and uh, we had some good offerings early in the month but um, again uh, a lot of people being on vacation and whatnot uh, so again uh, being the last one of the month to meet our needs and uh, uh, of our church and all of our expenses we really need a good offering this morning so anything you can do to help uh, overcome that would be greatly appreciated and uh, give graciously as it says. Again the one who is taught the word of God is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, this he also reaps. And again, we should be reaping to God and to the glory of God in our giving. So let's just pray for our offering right now. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give to you the first fruits of all that you have given to us. And we ask that you bless these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and, bl uh, and bless our church through them. By the power of the Spirit, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> 